Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping notes and community guidelines to mention. Um, one, if you have any sound or technical issues today, please let me know in the chat box with a direct message, and I'll do my best to help you out. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording, as well as uh, a PDF of the presentation, is going to be sent out to all registrants within probably the next week or so, I'd say. Um, we will be doing a QA and a at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to send any of your questions through the chat box at any time during the presentation, and we'll go through them all at the end. Um, and we just ask that you hold each other with mutual respect and come to this space teachable, and please stay engaged with our presenter throughout this program. So now I just wanted to share a little bit about the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York program. DIPSNY, as we like to call it, is a collaboration between the New York State Archives and the New York State Library, the services provided by the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts. Uh, DIPSNY is a statewide program that provides free planning and education services to support the vast network of collecting institutions, such as archives, libraries, historical societies, uh, museums, and all other organizations that safeguard and ensure access to New York's historical um, records. <coughs> Excuse me. So DIPSNY services include archival needs assessments, preservation and condition surveys, strategic planning assistance, and access to a variety of educational programs, such as this webinar. So to learn more about our services, you can visit us at dhpsny.org. And so with all of that, I'm going to pass things over to Kate to get us started with today's presentation. Hello, everybody. Again, sorry for the delay. Um, we, had, <laughs> we had some crazy uh, PowerPoint issues, but we're all set now. So. Um, thanks, Leah, for that introduction. Um, I am the preservation specialist for DIPSNY, so I do preservation um, uh, assessments all around the state and also uh, provide workshops and training and technical assistance. And I'm excited to present today about advocacy and collections care. This is content that was mostly put together by Diani Faiga, who is head of the Preservation Services Office at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts in Philadelphia. Um, who kind of oversees Dipsney work. And um, so she really pulled the bulk of this together for our presentation um, previously. And I've kind of, we've kind of taken it and, um, and been able to share it with Dipsney folks too. So uh, a hat tip to her for, um, for the content here. And I'm excited to share. We're gonna hold questions to the end, as Leah said. So, um, and I'm gonna turn off my camera um, so it's not distracting here and we'll get right into the slides. Hang on, let's see. All right, I'm just trying to, I'm already having in the screen share. I'm just trying to figure out how to turn off my camera. Hang on one second. Oop, oh, I ended the sharing, hang on. Let's see, well, now maybe I can, sorry about this, you guys. Now I'm gonna stop my video. Okay. Hmm, Leah, are you seeing that? Can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Your video is and off. What do you... And I see oh, your screen, but not the presentation. There we go. Now you're in presentation mode. You're good to go. Okay, super. All right. And you're not seeing any of like the... Um, uh control bar panel at the bottom right uh just the little powerpoint one for you to progress the slides forward hang on that right. looks good. so that here. looks good we're good yep good to go okay awesome all right sorry everybody it's like you know we haven't ever done zoom before but <laughs> so um so advocacy in collections care so this topic is so core to what we do in our work at dipsney um, and what I want to do today is to help you think through advocating for your collections and collections care in particular and provide some resources. Um, so we'll, I'm just going to do a little, or we kind of did an intro already. Um, I want to talk a little bit about preparing for ad advocacy work, excuse me, and then really getting into some of the nuts and bolts of ad advocacy work. So advocacy, of course, is supporting or promoting the interests of a particular cause or group. Um, the cause we'll be talking about today is collections, um, whether at a museum, a library, a historic site, or archive. Um, this information is applicable kind of across institutions. 
When people think about advocacy, they often first think about lobbying, about connecting with legislators. Um, the image on the top here is um, Conservation Center staff and others on the Hill for Museums Advocacy Day a few years ago. Um, and for this presentation, we'll consider this kind of external advocacy. Um, and you know that also includes kind of working on fundraising and then kind of external um, you know, grant applications and things. Um, and lots of what I, I, I'll talk about today can be applied to the work of connecting with you know, your federal, the federal government, your local governments, preparing grant applications. But this presentation is gonna focus on internal advocacy, which really can be as simple as two people talking, sharing ideas, being open to learning, um, internal advocacy is working to get the support your collections need from your institution's staff, administration, and board. So why do we need to do this internal advocacy work? Um, I know everyone in this, in, you know, on this webinar here has an answer to this question. Um, here are some common reasons I wanted to share. So professional responsibility. Um, our responsibility as archivists, librarians, and collections professionals is to care for and protect the collections with which we work. Um, so we have a, a conservation or a collections advocacy toolkit that we have at the Conservation Center. And I, I'll share that link with you in a little bit. Um, and we've got a quote in there that says, the public entrusts cultural organizations to serve as guardians of this material evidence with the expectation that the organizations will model responsible stewardship of collections. This complex task requires the attention of all staff members and the cooperation of visitors and guests. So professional responsibility, of course, is kind of a, you know, a, a quick answer to why we need to do this, this advocacy work. Educating decision makers is another reason. It might seem kind of implicit to all of us as collection staff and volunteers even routinely working with collections, but we must recognize there are always competing priorities for resources and attention. And we can't always assume that coworkers and decision makers at our institution share our understanding and commitment to collections care. Another reason we would wanna advocate is potentially to break the stereotype of the dusty archives. Why, why is what we're doing important in the current landscape? How are the collections relevant when the museum visitation has changed so much over the past few years? How are your collections relevant to the mission of your organization and to the broader world? And of course, a big reason we need to advocate for collections care is because when institutional budgets are stretched thin, it's often resources for this behind the scenes work that is, are decreased or even eliminated, a casualty of quote unquote cuts to non-essential services. But of course, as we all know, they're not non-essential, non-essential. So if it's new to you, before you jump into advocacy work, you may wanna spend some time laying the groundwork. A good resource for this is um, a guide called the Act Quick Assessment. Um, it's a short version of the Alliance for Justice's Advocacy Capacity Tool. Um, and you can just uh, scan this QR code here to get to it, or we'll also send you, um, when we send a copy of the slides, you can pull it from, from there as well. Um, so that's aimed at grassroots political and social activism, but we definitely can apply it to our collections care scenario. So completing this tool um, provides a snapshot of your organization's current capacity or readiness to engage in advocacy work. It helps you document your assets, locate potential gaps, and prioritize areas to strengthen and grow. This is useful even if you have a small collections department or even are a department of one. Um, and again, it's focused on external advocacy, but the framework um, can apply to internal advocacy as well. I'll use the phrase collections care interchangeably with preservation in this um, webinar here. So let's take a quick look at defining preservation so we're all on the same page. So preservation refers to any actions or considerations that protect collections and help to prolong their existence. It requires a holistic look at the collections in their environment, not just environment in terms of temperature, humidity, light, and pollutants, although of course those are all important factors, but everything around the collections that might have an impact on them, directly or indirectly, including the way they're handled and managed, resources available for um, and devoted to their care, the facilities and space in which they're stored and used, so again, preservation actions are those which are intended to slow deterioration and mitigate risk. One of the most useful tools you can prepare before you really jump into internal advocacy work is a preservation plan. 
this document maps out what you hope to do with your institution's collections in the next three to five years. Sometimes framed as a strategic plan specifically for collections care, a detailed preservation plan can direct and guide the ongoing care and management of the collections by outlining collections needs, ongoing projects, uh, necessary staffing and other resources, and identifying what institutional strategic goals the collections projects address. This plan can really help collection staff communicate their vision to colleagues, administrators, and of course, externally potential funders, and also remain on task internally. There are many uh, tools and templates out there for preservation plans, and they can take many formats. It doesn't have to be super elaborate, but a plan can go a long way to ensuring that at least um, at least increase attention to collections needs. When articulating goal, collections goals, acknowledge the reality of your situation and strike a balance between best practices and what's actually feasible for you and your institution in the, in the moment. You'll wanna demonstrate the importance and value of these actions without overwhelming and presenting unachievable goals. So this is what we call the roadmap approach. So if your organization has, say, no climate control in a storage space, what would be the best possible you know, goal to, to achieve there? Of course, it would be to have a fully outfitted HVAC system with strict temperature and humidity set points. That's likely not immediately feasible, but your administration needs to know that that would be the ultimate recommendation, the best practice. And if you can articulate kind of incremental steps starting with something as simple as keeping windows closed, purchasing a data logger, and potentially maybe investigating grants for an HVAC unit, this can help you respond to potential pushback and questions, and it shows that you understand that perfect is the enemy of good. When you have a list of potential projects, you might need help prioritizing them. The Conservation Center has developed a feasibility impact rating that you can apply to collections projects. Um, and this next slide will have a little bit more detail about it, but in general, you would rate um, a certain project's impact on your collection on a scale of one to five. On that same scale, you would rate the feasibility of that project actually happening. And then you add them together, and then the total you get is what we consider the impact rating. So dividing up a list of projects with these impact rating numbers can kind of help you prioritize them. So this is just a screenshot here of an example um, of how you would kind of uh, do this, um, you know, rating system here for, um, you know, the strategy, the desired outcome, the resources you would need, and then um, you know, the different actions you would want to take to realize this this one aspect of a strategic plan. And so um, you can see here the the impact number is a four, the feasibility, um, you know, number is a three. So you know, maybe it's possible, um, and actually. It says uh, add in them together and the total is the impact rating, but it looks like um, the multiplying them gave this number here 12. So that, I, I, I maybe that's a little unclear, but I guess the point is that you can certainly um, use a numbering system like this to kind of prioritize um, different collections projects um, and help you uh, kind of put them on a timeline in your preservation plan. Um, the center does have a worksheet that's helpful in starting this process and, and we'll definitely explain more about that, um, that impact, the feasibility impact rating numbers. So um, you can take a, or get a link there from this QR code to the center's preservation planning worksheet. Um, of course, we are a very big proponents here at Dipsney of preservation plans, but it's not just us. Um, the conservation center, uh, a few years ago, um, conducted a survey of small to mid-sized Philadelphia area institutions that do have preservation plans in place. And just a note here that you can see these results really underscore the benefits of adopting a preservation plan. So 95% of these um, institutions reported that the plan raised awareness of collections needs. 89% reported that it supported efforts to solicit funds for recommended preservation projects. And almost half of the um, the answers or the the institutions reported that it resulted in actual dollars, so increased internal funding allocations for preservation work. So the, what really the bottom line here is, you if you haven't done a preservation plan yet, definitely put it on your list. 
Now let's get into the nuts and bolts of internal advocacy work. It's a large topic and I've divided it into sections around the framework of who, what, when, where, why, and how. So the first one is around who, knowing your audience. Who are the decision makers who need to hear your message? Um, so for example, the roof in collection storage is leaking. Who is responsible for prioritizing and funding capital projects at your institution? Is that the head of facilities, if you have that position? Is it a board member? Somebody who's on the facilities committee? Is it the museum director? What information would that person need to make your case to the board? And kind of as a related question here, do you really know how decisions are made at your institution? Um, you know, both the formal way and uh, there's always kind of an informal back channel way. So that information is, is helpful to know um, when you're thinking about uh, who needs to hear your advocacy message. Really an unwritten part of collections job descriptions is that we really are communicators and educators um, and we have to network to build these relationships to uh, you know, understand who in your institution um, you know, is important to, uh, to, to plead your case to, to benefit the collections. Um, you know, we need to build and nurture these relationships. So getting to know decision makers, understanding their point of view is important. What are their priorities? What are the stakes that they have to deal with? Um, you know, how will supporting preservation initiatives help or hurt the other things they have to balance? Uh, what types of requests have had success with them in the, in the, in the past? So really understanding these, um, you know, decision makers, nurturing these relationships um, will go a long way towards getting your message across. Um, and finally, you wanna recognize that you may need to craft a little bit different messages for different recipients, depending on their position and kind of what they value, what their priorities are. So let's talk, oh no, I guess we forgot to, see, this is what happened with our slides. Oh my gosh, Leah, I guess we, I forgot to do this one here. Um, this uh, says kind of in uh, English, it should say, let's talk about the common things that you'll be advocating for. So luckily most of this slide is um, infographics or icons. Um, we will have a, obviously an updated slide when you guys get the final um, presentation of this. So obviously the dollar sign here, funding is an obviously obvious thing that you'll be advocating for. Possibly the first thing that comes to mind when you think about advocacy. Um, some different ways to think about funding for preservation um, relate to its logistics. How is preservation budgeted at your organization? Is there a specific budget line item for preservation supplies? Or is everything kind of lumped in together and you have to make a specific request when you need something? Um, is it lumped in with operations? What's your kind of best case budget scenario? So really understanding all that um, is helpful in making your case. Uh, the people icon here, perhaps the greatest commitment when it comes to preservation would be hiring a staff position entirely dedicated to collections care and preservation. Certainly this is rarely the case in smaller institutions. We all know it's often incorporated into other jobs and responsibilities, um, but actually having the word preservation and related activities written into job descriptions gives the work credibility and goes a long way towards ensuring that it's being done. You'll also need to advocate for appropriate training and professional development for your people. Uh, the clock here um, relates to the job description point here. If staff does not have a formally mandated responsibility to spend time pursuing collections care activities, other concerns will often take priority. So having time set aside to undertake preservation functions can be crucial. Um, the shelving with the boxes here, um, you also obviously have to advocate for space. As we all know, preservation activities take up space. Um, standard recommendations for full-time staff processing workspace. A best, best practice would be 150 square feet per individual. And this is a stat from the National Fire Protection Association. And that's a quite, quite a large footprint there. So having adequate space really becomes even more critical when we have to spread out collections for sorting, for rehousing, for cleaning. Um, you know, ideally we'd have separate spaces where collections can be sorted at the point of acquisition to ensure that uh, you know, mold or pests or other contaminants don't come into collection storage. Um, so space is, is obviously a huge issue. Um, 
And finally, there are some other intangible things that you might need to advocate for. And this is where the, the eye icon comes in here. Um, resources like recognition of support, authority, respect, and even just attention paid to collections are intangible, but have a great impact on collections care. Your organization's mission statement and strategic plan are two places that give preservation attention. Um, like in the job descriptions, actually incorporating the word preservation into your mission statement gives it importance and credibility and links our work to our organization's driving purpose. Um, the example here is from the Chester County History Center in Pennsylvania. And I've uh, capitalized the word preserves just to kind of highlight it here. But you can see that preservation is, um, is front and center there in their mission statement. The same goes for including the word preservation in your strategic plan. Um, having preservation specifically identified as a goal or in the action items can help ensure continued attention and elevate collections care to a critical facet of institutional operations. This here is just a kind of a made up example of how preservation could fit into a strategic goal um, and, and the action items. Um, so again, I, I've capitalized, you know, preventive conservation here um, as kind of, in, you know, the, the way to include uh, preservation and, and some action items. So it's just a sample for a strategic plan. Um, so now we're on to when, uh, and just really a quick note here about when to be advocating for collections. Um, for formal requests, budget requests especially, you want to understand the budget process and timeline at your institution. Um, it's often hard to make changes once the budget's passed. For example, if there is an annual board meeting in July to review, say, like the second half of the fiscal year and make changes, don't come to the board with your collections care request in August. Um, and then for general educating and relationship building around collections care, of course, you want to be able or you want to be doing this um, all year long. Now let's talk about where you are advocating. The sky is the limit really, but here are some concrete examples. At staff meetings, you can request a set time on the agenda to talk about collections care and preservation uh, as, you know, on a regular basis. See if collections care representatives can attend other departmental or working group meetings. Um, making sure collections storage is part of tours and orientations for new staff members at all levels, giving people a, a real sense of what's behind the scenes. Um, advocating with your board at board meetings. Um, we, there's a, a link that I'll share on the next slide here, um, but there's a report called Capitalizing on Collections Care. It's put out by IMLS uh, a number of years ago. Um, it's a publication that includes several tips for board engagement, such as making sure a session on collection stewardship is part of new board member orientation. Um, and again, getting people into storage or into collections areas as part of board meetings, you can take board members on a field trip to see storage. Um, don't be afraid to show the problem spots. And then also featuring collections care topics regularly in board meetings, um, in the presentations and in their information packets. Um, you can advocate as part of exhibitions. Um, preservation actions, especially conservation treatment um, is, is something you can definitely incorporate into exhibits. So if, for example, if a, a, a piece was treated before it was placed on exhibit, you can show a, a before image next to the item itself and kind of you know, really highlight the importance of preservation work to get something to a state where it can be displayed. Um, if lights in your gallery are noticeably dim, you can put a label somewhere in the space explaining the importance of restricting light exposure to the collections materials. So just really educating people um, and, you know, if you're exhibiting a reproduction rather than the original of something, you can explain, again, why that's happening. Um, so, again, just really uh, educating kind of, um, you know, certainly internally for other folks in the museum who will see these exhibits, this blends into kind of external advocacy a little bit, too, um, since exhibits are so public. And, again, a little bit uh, for external advocacy, just kind of building um, your impact on social media. So incorporating preservation initiatives into social media or other outreach efforts 
Um, again, before and after photos can have a lot of visual impact. Um, you can show rehousing of objects. You can show how you've reconfigured storage spaces. People love a glimpse of behind the scenes. Um, and raising awareness of preservation with your larger kind of visitor and in, an online audience will only help you as you're working on your internal advocacy as well. So here's that uh, IMLS uh, report I mentioned, um, capitalized on collections care. So this is actually um, from 2007. So it's um, certainly um, on the older side. Uh, so there's a lot of grant information in here that's out of date, but there are some good ideas nonetheless. It's worth, um, worth a look despite its age. So let's return to the why of advocacy and look at some specifics. Um, most advocacy messages state the impact and relevance of the actions that you're requesting support for. Um, you know, impact is often data-driven. Some examples of measurable impact like audiences served, outcomes achieved, or economic impact um, is, is kind of where that data comes in. Things that are harder to measure but are also impactful are you know, knowledge gained, uh, critical thinking engaged, experiences contextualized, and also what impact will your institution face if collections care isn't funded or if you don't have the appropriate human resources to really take care of your collections. And relevance, we wanna think about relevance again, going back to connecting your preservation work to your institution's overall mission and goals. <clears throat> so it's important that advocacy work is, is clear and compelling and concise. And I'm gonna, um, the following slides are kind of some examples of how you might phrase particular asks. And this is just to kind of get a sense of of using that data and um, the impact and the relevancy um, in your requests. So if budget cuts is something you're facing, um, you can, you know, here's an example. We request that the collections budget be reduced by 5%, not the 20% called for. We're asking this because a 20% reduction will mean we serve 500 fewer students annually and can't work with professors to develop classes that use primary resources. So clearly stating the impact with some numbers there. Again, with budget cuts, um, you know, cutting our collections budgets will cut our digitization output by 60%. It will now take, you know, half as long, again, as long for new content to be added to our online catalog. Um, you know, you can put in collections access numbers here and, and kind of show the institutional reach and, um, it, kind of making the case that the online collection and the digitization work that supports it is a valuable resource and needs to be sustained uh, kind of at current funding. So again, um, the relevancy, relevancy and the impact um, in a fairly concise way here. If you're looking at staff cuts, um, a way to think about an, an ask here of reducing staff cuts, um, showing the impact if, you know, it, our staff has to spend half their time preparing collections for exhibit. If we lose a position, we won't be able to, you know, respond to research requests or do other work um, kind of as quickly. So kind of understand the impact of, of having less people. Um, here's an interesting one that um, kind of takes the long view here. So again, thinking about staff cuts, this is, you know, for example, our conservators are real innovators in the field. Their work is essential to our exhibition program. Um, ensuring the collections are accessible to the public. Their work brings in X amount in grants and contributions. If you reduce staff in this department, um, there will be ramifications both internally and externally. And here I think it's important, you know, people, for people to think, you know, long-term rebuilding the depth of this professional knowledge would take uh, seven to 10 years. Um, so that's a, a pretty impactful statement there um, against some staff cuts. So advocating for increased time, um, you know, saying the project we have coming up is essential to our mission and we're excited to work on it, but we need four months, not two, to ensure we can properly, you know, get the, get the collections ready for this. So even something as simple as that, a way to, um, to kind of show the impact. Again, our supporting authority is something else you might want to advocate for and then um, a way to phrase this, um, you know, the collections team, you know, loves and does a lot of work with the education team, but we need to have, be able to have the final say, um, you know, and how objects can be used for programs based on their condition. Um, so again, being concise and clear, impact and relevancy, 
um, is important for um, for these bits of information, you know, these advocacy asks. So for the final section, um, how are you advocating? I wanna share uh, a number of resources here. So pulling together numbers for your proposed collections care projects is of course critical. Um, I've got a couple links here. If you are doing any digitization work, you might wanna check out this digitization cost calculator. Um, it's specifically about calculating the cost of digitizing projects. Um, and then we've got tools like the Preservation Manager's Guide to Cost Analysis. And then at the bottom QR code, the Oregon Heritage Commission's Collections Budget Report um, are great resources with very detailed information on kind of accurately calculating costs for collections work. Um, again, those last two are a little dated, but certainly um, concepts still apply and frameworks um, are still useful. And then as I was kind of researching this, um, I, I came across another way um, to think about costs that somebody suggested. And this is, I don't know how useful it is for every situation, but um, kind of these numbers might be more impactful for non-museum folks. Um, and, it's some, you can calculate kind of the cost per item of your collection. So what is your institutional investment per item for your collection? So say your collection's budget is $20,000 and you have two staff salaries totaling 90,000. So, you know, the institution is spending $110,000 annually on collections, but if your collection is 200,000 items, you know, that two full-time staff members and $20,000 in supplies is caring for 200,000 things, each collection item only gets about 55 cents a year in terms of expert staff time and supplies for their care. Um, so it really, you know, obviously not everything needs 55 cents and some obviously more, some don't need any anything, but it's it's a way to, a kind of an interesting way to make your case, um, you know, for these historically valuable and potentially irreplaceable collections, you're spending 55 cents a year on each item. So just, an interesting way to put it in perspective. Um, so using statistics is obviously um, a helpful part of making these advocacy cases here. Um, so the ALA, American Library Association, has a preservation statistics report. This was data collected about long-term preservation trends in the library field. Um, it covers conservation, assessment, exhibition, preventive conservation, uh, reformatting, digitization, digital preservation and asset management. So it's very thorough, um, again, published in 2015. So it's getting older, but it's still, I think a useful resource to review. Um, and if you're really into statistics, there are data sets from 2017 to 2019 available um, in this report, but they're not uh, kind of analyzed and, um, and summarized, but still there for you to work with. Um, Another great resource for data to inform your advocacy work is the IMLS Heritage Health Information Survey. Um, this survey was done in 2014, but the data wasn't analyzed and released till 2019. So um, a little bit older still, but um, it's really a wealth of information on the state of collections care and preservation in the US. And it's really especially helpful for gathering kind of comp comparative information and showing where your institution is on a national scale. Um, as an important part of preparing your advocacy requests um, and kind of knowing the landscape inside and outside your institution, what work has already been done that you can point to, what are similar institutions doing? And again, that's where that IMLS Heritage Health um, Survey can come in, uh, come in useful to kind of give you a little bit broader perspective. Um, for example, if you're trying to, for a grant to support like the Smith collection of paintings at your institution, you know, an inventory level conservation assessment, you kind of you want, you know, this work done on this collection of paintings, it's important for you to know that, you know, 10 years ago, a survey was already done. Um, it doesn't mean that it's not valid to do it again, but you have to have your justification prepared. You don't want to be blindsided with information you know, that you could have known. And leveraging partners is also important, um, both inside and outside your institution. They are really an invaluable part of the advocacy process. Um, cross-disciplinary, cross-departmental collaboration is important to broadening support for collections care. As different you know, divisions or, or departments inside your institution grow to understand each other and work on projects together, 
So certainly interest um, and, and understanding has increased. Um, so, you know, digitization, policy development, emergency preparedness, exhibition planning, um, and outreach efforts are all examples of areas uh, with fruitful collaboration opportunities and that can really lead to a significant impact on collections care. Who's got the skills to help you make your case and is knowledgeable about the resources at your disposal? Or somebody who's got helpful institutional knowledge. So looking for allies and champions who can give you credibility and or have influence um, with your administration. Uh, this is sometimes even more the case if they're not working directly with the collections themselves. Um, you know, could a researcher or a volunteer write a letter or, or help to advocate on your behalf? So obviously, you know your collections, but you know, do others know how? But do you know how others know your collections? This is kind of an interesting way to think about it, um, and an important thing to to kind of be aware of as you're working on advocacy. Um, the Conservation Center developed uh, what they call the Collections 20 Questions. Uh, it's a worksheet that really helps you describe your collections and how they serve the interests of your visitors and supporters. Um, it's helpful as you work to refine your audience in terms of um, your, uh, your advocacy needs. Uh, it's part of a larger collections advocacy toolkit, which is also a great resource, and that's what this QR code uh, takes you to. And then once you've done your research and crafted your ask, you need a communications plan to really help execute your advocacy. Um, Smart Chart is a free tool designed to help mission-driven organizations create actionable and effective communications plans. Um, it breaks down communication planning into six steps uh, from the initial discussions to a reality check to make sure your strategy is sound. So that's a helpful uh, tool. It's again, not aimed at specifically um, collecting institutions, but uh, the framework is uh, completely applicable. So I did want to share a little bit of a case study on um, kind of effective internal advocacy for collections care. Um, and I've had a number of conversations with Julie Rockwell, who is the archivist for the East Broad Tau Railroad Archives and Special Collections in South Central Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, she her institution is kind of a, a good example. I wanted to share some, some photos and some of her experience. Um, so imagine walking into a historic railroad passenger station built in 1906 with three brick laden vaults, 5,200 cubic feet and 360 square feet of storage space. And then imagine those vaults being stuffed from floor to ceiling with archival materials from maps to organizational records, completely unprocessed, many physical artifacts and nothing had been touched since this uh, railroad site was abandoned in 1956. Um, so as Julie notes here, this railroad was built in 1872 and um, it's now a tourist destination. Um, they offer train and trolley rides and tours of this incredible kind of uh, in untouched industrial site. Um, but importantly, the archives and kind of all those collections things stored in those vaults were not part of the site's mission um, until 2021 uh, when they were made into a special program and Julie was hired. So this um, kind of the Railroad Archives and Special Collections Program established in 2021 uh, is a kind of conjoined unit between the foundation of this railroad and then the Friends of um, the railroad. So it's it's got kind of an interesting structure. But again, um, in their mission statement here, you can see that preserve, and I've um, capitalized that, pre preservation is written into their mission statement. And uh, it's just the beginning of her journey for advocating for um, saving these collections. And you'll see this is kind of how things were found, just, um, you know, books and papers and documents, really archives everywhere in these vaults. The more examples of that, completely unprocessed, untouched since 1956. So really, um, Julie and her, her small team had a, a very daunting task. Um, so they actually, um, six months after the archives were incorporated, Julie worked with um, Diani Faga here at the Conservation Center on a preservation survey, which again, we mentioned is a very important first step in this advocacy work. 
Um, and then six months later, after that, she was able to um, present the survey's executive summary to her board and to other stakeholders. Um, so as Julie noted here, um, the plan, the preservation plan defined immediate solutions, the things they could do quickly, such as installing UV film on, on windows, um, laying out short-term goals, like the continuing and inventory. Um, she said the strategic plan is also guiding, kind of building the necessary policies, procedures, and workflows they need to establish um, this formal archiving archival processing workflows, um, digital preservation and collections care. And really her comment about this preservation plan was that this report hugely increased awareness of the state of the railroad's unique collections and really helped convince the board of the need to fund this new segment of the organization. Um, so you can see here, um, this is a slide, part of a presentation that Julie created here. It's showing the results of her advocacy work so far, just two years after launching this archive, um, kind of as its own separate, um, you know, function in this organization. And a year after undergoing the preservation survey, she's gotten almost $160,000 in donations, a $5,000 grant for staff equipment and supplies. Um, she's also initiated museum archive days to build community awareness, again, with some advocacy work. Um, and she's helped local university students put on an exhibition that received over 700 visitors in the fall of 2022. So really a, a great success story for Julie and her team and a real testament to the power of advocating for your collections. Um, and so here's just some, some of the work she's done and, and getting some things processed here. Um, so, you know, ongoing inventories, figuring out processing priorities, and, uh, you know, again, all this work to just raise as much awareness as she can, both internally and externally, um, for the collections, the importance of these collections, and the importance of, um, of funding them. And just some more uh, shots of her team and the work they're doing, scanning and rehousing things. Um, really just a great story. So... Just wanted to share a little bit of a case study there and um, we have come to the end. I am happy to take some questions. I'm gonna stop, actually maybe I won't stop my screen share so you guys can um, keep this contact information here. We are always available to answer your questions. Um, if you think of something that relates to advocacy or really any other um, you know, preservation topic, um, you're always welcome to be in touch with Dipsney. Um, we are here for technical assistance, uh, whether or not you are working on a preservation or archival assessment with us, um, we're, we're happy to help um, for free of charge. And then obviously connect with us on social to, um, to see what we've been up to and, and see you know, what we're doing and, and what uh, events and education is upcoming. So Leah, how's that for the end here? Do, should we go into some questions from the chat? Um, as of now, we don't have any questions, but I'm happy to give just a moment or two for folks to type them out in case we're missing any. Sure. Yeah, and again, just to reiterate, um, we will be sending a PDF of this uh, the, the slides, and so you'll absolutely be able to get those QR codes. Um, out for or for all those links I shared. So and there's some great tools in there. Unfortunately, a lot of things are a little bit out of date, um, but um, certainly worth a look and uh, worth kind of extrapolating, you know, framework or concepts um, to apply to uh, to your situation. So hopefully that's helpful. And again, we're always here for questions. And if you know, we can help you help guide you to other resources or other folks doing, you know, similar work to you or in a similar situation as your institution, you know, we're always happy to connect folks with others um, around the state as well. All right, I'm still not seeing anything in the chat. Um, so I think okay. we're going to close out for the day. Thank Great. you all for coming uh, and keep an eye out for your in your inboxes for the recording and a PDF of the slides. Thanks all. Have a good one. Thanks, Leah.